All right, so welcome everybody. This is the first uh, official interview of uh, Fantasy Book Critics new videocast series. Uh, this will be a series wherein we will be meeting with uh, our, some of our favorite authors and we will get to discuss with them about their favorite books. So joining me today is Richard Nell. Uh, you will know him from his wonderfully, uh, you know, incredibly complex uh, Ash and Sand trilogy, as well as the most recent uh, Beyond Ash and Sand book titled Dark Seas End. I'm going to hand it over to uh, him to introduce himself and then I'll talk a little bit more. Well, you, Richard. I'm, I'm here for the inaugural journey of the FBC interview as well. You've more or less done a job interviewing me already. I'm a Canadian author. I, uh, I write books. Ash and Sand is probably what I'm most known for, which is a, a trilogy. I like to say longer than Lord of the Rings, but um, yeah, there's some new books on the way beyond Ash and Sand. And there's another project I'll be doing this year called Descending Dragon. But we are not here to discuss me. No, sir. Mm -hmm. We are here to discuss Dune. Yes, we are. And thank you for that. And I also see Godkin's Legacy to your left. And I know that's one other book of yours, which is really fantastic as well, right over there. So yes, we are here to discuss Dune because that is the book that you have chosen as one of your favorites. I know that along that, along with the uh, James Clavel one of Shogun, that's the, those are the two of really, two books which you really endorse and happily read it over the years. So let's begin talking about Dune, the seminal epic by Frank Herbert, uh, which I believe was published in 1965, but also was released as a serial from 1963 to 1964 ish in the, in the analog magazine. So over to you, Richard, sir. Why do you like it? What is it about Dune that you know, capt you know, captures your imagination? Please let us know. It's funny how the simplest questions are sort of the hardest questions to answer. Um, there's lots of reasons to like it. Um, I, it's funny, I've seen interviews with Frank Herbert over the years just to get his, he was, he's fairly rare. He didn't like to do interviews clearly, but he, he did do some. And um, I'm, I always say this, but I say there's what you're trying to do as a writer or as an artist and what you actually did. And in some ways, I don't think he did what he tried to do, if that makes any sense. Um, but what he did do was nonetheless masterful. And one thing that he always says that I, I, I think is exactly right and what makes it so famous is that he knew he had to be, he had to tell a great story. No matter what else he was trying to do and you know, whatever you're trying to do in fiction, you have to tell a great story. And that's what he did. So he has incredibly fascinating characters with archetypal story, you know, with the, the sort of uh, heroic journey and the... Um, you know, you've got some clear villains, but you've also got some grayer characters. Um, you've got this almost messiah-like figure who's, who's rising. And it's just, it's very easy for anyone to get on board with this story, to understand it, even though it is very complex and it has this amazing world building and it has this vast universe. Um, he's done a bunch of clever things to, to hook you and also to make it, I'm not a real sci-fi fan. Um, and he, he does not make this really a sci-fi story in any kind of way that would overwhelm someone. And it's funny because, again, in some of his interviews, he he's talks about some of his Arab friends and they say sci-fi, it's a religious story. And um, so I think it's a different story to different people, which is another sign of how, how masterful it is. It's got enough meat in there. It's dense enough. That, that different people react to it in incredibly different ways. And you see this if you look at reviews or if you look at, you know, you ask somebody what they thought of it and they'll, the way that they'll tell you this, what they thought of or what they got out of it is completely different than what somebody else will get out of it, which is always fascinating to me, but, but a sign of a very deep, almost philosophical work mm -hmm. that is doing all of those things in the background and, and you can react to them very differently. And yet is telling a straightforward story that somebody who's just picked it up and is maybe 16 years old can read through it and understand. You hit some great points because you, like you mentioned, you know, it is 
he basically wrote a simple, like not simple, he wrote a journey about, it, it was basically about the hero's journey with, you know, uh, with our main character of Paul, you know, who's trying to become from his teenage years to trying to be on the, you know, on the, on the planet and then trying to figure out his destiny. But at the same time, like you mentioned, different people take different things out of it. There's the religious aspect. There's the whole complex world building. Because like you mentioned, even though it's they, they travel to the planet of Arrakis, they are traveling from their own home planet and there are other people who are coming from different, different planets. But like you mentioned, it's the, the sci-fi element is there in the background, but it doesn't overwhelm the story. I really love that as well. Now, I did, I did want to talk to you or I did want to ask you because you specifically mentioned this one thing, like he didn't you know, basically do what he tried, but he was still successful. Can you maybe expound on that? Like, what do you mean by that? And what it is that, you know, you try to yeah. just clarify that, sorry. Well, I, I think he's a classic example of just doing what he loved, just doing what he was passionate about. I don't think he thought particularly about being successful, you know, and, and when Dune was tremendously successful, I think he was as surprised as anybody. Hmm. Um, so, you know, he would not be the right guy, not that you'd talk about it this way back in the you know 70s or 80s or whatever, about like, how do you make a successful book? You know, I don't think he had any idea and I don't think he cared. He wrote what he was passionate about. He was passionate about these environmental topics. He was passionate about um, religion and the hero's journey and also hero worship. Um, so all these themes that he was trying to wrap into this story. And I just, he just happens to be a natural storyteller, which is what I'm sure drove him to write fiction in the first place. But it was, it was obvious that he was just trying to explore these themes. And um, so I think that makes him quite a bit different than some of the, and I, I know maybe we can get into it later, but he, he had quite a bit of issues with uh, George Lucas and the Star Wars franchise and there was a lot of talk that they'd stolen stuff from him. And uh, I think the success of Star Wars kind of wounded him in a way. He was, um, because he, his film was not successful. And um, he, I don't think he had any idea why. And it, he, he was even, he'd made the screenplay um, for the first Dune movie. And the, the director, whose name now escapes me. who David Lynch? I don't know if it was Lynch who I don't think it was Lynch who originally was going to make it. Oh yeah, I think there was, was an Italian director or French, some European director who was there's there's even a documentary made about that as well. Like you know his because with the artwork and everything, and they just never could go forward with that. You're right. Yes. Well, so basically, Herbert had made the screenplay. He'd made the screenplay for this himself for this director. The director took one look at this. It was supposed to be like three hours or something in his mind, and he just thought it's not workable. Can't do it, and he gave up. And so it wasn't till later until, uh, you know, David Lynch got on board or, and, and, you know, more or less reimagined it and they created it to varying degrees of success, I would say, in terms of how they produced it. But it, it was a commercial failure or at least not very successful. And so they, they canceled the, um, the movies that were supposed to follow. So I think it really wounded Herbert um, because he didn't understand why his wasn't successful and maybe star wars what you know or i could tell you we could talk about that but there's not much point i just it's not it's not translatable to film very easily mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons and you know we could talk about the newer films too but it's just a much more deep philosophical thematic book and it's just really hard to translate that properly into a, a, a more shallow you know, if you're looking at a movie, you just, because you, you have to do it in two hours, three hours. I'm not trying to call film shallow. It's just a time constraint. Mm -hmm. You just can't do what Dune was doing. You're right. Uh, you absolutely hit the nail on the head because even though Dune begins so simply, like, you know, I remember the first page of it. It's just Paul describing, you know, his mother kind of being tense and him, you know, being tested by the Ben Gesser. And I'm, if I mispronounce it, you know, horribly, I'm sorry. But, you know, I don't it, know it, either. It, it, it begins from a very simple point, but then it gets more and more complex. And sometimes, you know, when you have complex books, writing a book, and of course, you would know this as well, you can explore complex concepts or complex view viewpoints in, 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 in a, on the page. It's a lot easier because you're allowing the reader's imag you know, imagination to fill in the blank spots. But on a screen, it becomes very difficult. And it becomes, and I'm, I'm pretty sure, like, you know, I think it was, uh, I kind of pulled it up, the, the French director, Alejandro, Shudorovsky or something French, like that. Okay. Yep, yeah, French. Uh, he was the guy who was planning to, you know, like you said, with 
Herbert's, you know, screenplay and trying to, you know, make up that. And that's why it just, it boggled his mind and it was like kind of nearly unfilmable at that moment. So, which is why they yes, just- Yes, well, and I'm no expert on making movies or making film scripts or, or so on, but I do know enough to know I'm ignorant. And I think Herbert probably somehow didn't realize or didn't know enough to know he was ignorant. And it's not the same, you know, it's a wildly different format. It's a different genre. And you, you know, the, just the, the plot beats, the, the things that happen in a TV show or a movie, they have to happen with, with such different speed um, that it's, you know, it's sort of confounding to a, a, a novel writer, especially one who's written a book as large as Dune, where your plot beats and, and your characterizations and so on just can take so much more time. And, um, so it's just a really different format. But that does not take away at all from the fact that Dune is a, a masterpiece. That's true. That definitely is. And of course, it, we could, we're also talking about the 1970s and 80s. You know, maybe the technology wasn't advanced at that time because he literally, his book is set in the outer space. It's on a different planet. There's inter, interstellar travel. They're showing these giant sandworms, all of which pretty cool. You know, especially, you know, you can, you can have an artist draw them and it looks really cool, but to have that show on the big screen, I'm not sure even the technology was available that time. And Star Wars, on the other hand, like you mentioned, you know, while it had all of the same things, but it did not have, it was more, you know, the, it, it didn't really need CGI. And of course, CGI was not a concept back then, but you could do with props. You could do a lot of things with props and show it in that way. And that's what the beauty of the original trilogy is. Like, you know, it allows the kid in people to enjoy the movie without, while it being a little bit corny and, Maybe that's why it was so successful. And I see yeah, well, have not seen Star, Star Wars, Wars is is just far less deep than Dune. And I'm I'm not criticizing it for that. It's just it's a different story. It um, and it's got some of the same archetypes and it's got some of the same similar themes, but it's still it's missing the, some of the major themes of, of Dune. It's just, as I say, it's far more shallow. It's not trying to explore, you know, Dune. And I guess maybe well now is as good as time as any. The main themes of Dune, in in Frank Herbert's opinion, which anybody could take issue with and say what they so they think the main themes are, are sort of uh, the resource, the spice. Um, so a single resource or limited resource. So let's call it just fossil fuels or something, mm -hmm. which is a, a linchpin, a central. Um, requirement so in other words he's thinking what are the weaknesses that humanity has you know what are the what are the things that are existential threats to us well one of them is that we rely so heavily on this on these fossil fuels or in his in his book um, melange i believe it's the spice and the other is in his opinion the the danger of sort of hero worship the danger mm -hmm. of following a leader unquestioningly and um, maybe to your own doom, um, and that that humanity, especially now that we have so much power, he's thinking you cannot put this much power into a in single individual's hands because we've got nuclear weapons now, and he could destroy us all if he's if he's a bad leader or he's crazy or he makes a mistake. Mm -hmm. So his, you know, and now we're getting more into the series as opposed to just the book, the single book of Doom. Yep, and maybe as a just to throw this out there i'm no i'm no expert on the series i have read it but it was a long time ago and i don't reread the other books i've only reread the first book and there's reasons for that but mm -hmm. he was trying to show look you cannot uh follow this leader blindly and that's a bad idea though i will suggest uh with all apologies to frank herbert he actually didn't do that um I think he was trying to show the the consequences of blindly following this leader, and he did sort of show the edges of it. And but I would suggest to you that that Paul is wildly successful. No, he is. Even uh, so, go ahead. So to say that he's trying to show that following um, the Quizats, Hatterats, or whatever, whatever you, mm -hmm. he doesn't really show that. I mean, he makes mistakes, don't get me wrong. And later on, there's you know, trillions of people die and so on. Mm -hmm. But the, the point of him is to save humanity. And he basically does that. Yep. Um, though... So I don't know. I, it, it's interesting. No, you, 
you bring up a fascinating point because you're right. You know, there there is a there's there's an element of nil, nihilism to you know Frank's text. You know, because he begins he set Paul's up on this hero's journey, and you kind of you know at that time, of course, this was 1960s, where there was not maybe that much nuance. Maybe science fiction we were just getting out of the golden age. Fantasy wasn't that popular. Fantasy wasn't even there that much. Tolkien had just been published. It was getting popular in the United States. But you know, people were expecting the hero's journey of you know the of people being successful, and of course the way Dune ends, and of course there's going to be spoilers in this podcast, uh, the way Dune ends, Paul is wildly successful in what his mother wants him to do, what he he seeks out the revenge for his father and his entire house, all of those are true. And then in the sequel books is where we get to see all the points that you mentioned, you know, the downfall due to his hero worship, while him being successful and while setting up his religion, new religion, or his jihad against the emperor and all the houses that were aligned against him in a way. What do you think about that, sir? Yeah, well, again, what if we look at his two themes, the hero worship or the being one, the other being fundamentally this universe, this this human species relies on spice. And without it, it's doomed. Mm -hmm. So Paul realizes that and his goal is to try and do something about it. Well, by the end of the series, unless I'm mistaken, but if I recall correctly, they have managed to figure out how to travel through deep space without spice. So, you know, it's, it's sort of technology has, has overcome this problem, let's say in, in a modern context or, or that's, so in other words, he, Paul has managed to, to lead humanity despite all of the problems into a new era where Arrakis is no longer required, where mm -hmm. human beings can travel through the universe without being reliant on this. And I think they've sort of shed their religion somewhat or, you know, there's, there's problems there, but um, there's no real solutions to those problems presented, I don't think, um, in, the, in the Dune series. Um, but nonetheless, humanity survives. Paul, Paul rules for 3,500 years as a half worm, half man creature, and, and humanity survives. So... I don't know. I guess you could say that it's not necessarily Paul who saves them, that humanity saves themselves, and then maybe they shouldn't have listened to Paul for so long. And, you know, they went through this 3,500 years and oh, they had all kinds of problems. Maybe they shouldn't have done that. But I, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult subject, I suppose. It definitely is. And you rightly said, because, you know, we're, we get to see the whole journey of him and his you know, his descendants over that 3,500 to 5,000 year period. And we, of course, get to see at the very end of what happens. But through it all, and of course, this is the omniscient view, which is kind of presided, you know, which is given to us in the novels, which is why we get to see these things. But the characters have no idea. Even Paul himself doubts him what he's doing is whether it's going to be effective, whether it's going to be even helpful going forward or not. All he knows that, you know, you're rightly, like you rightly said, humanity cannot depend on this small amount of spice, which is dwindling. And which means that one planet has to be become a desert planet so that the sandworms can survive and the spice can be mined. But it's always going to lead to conflict, which is the base of his, you know, the problems of humanity that humans will always find something to fight over and things like that. Yes. All right. Well, that it's interesting Maybe this is where the realm of Dune might cross over into the realm of sort of Aldous Huxley or um, what's the word? Orwell, where what is the alternatives, right? So if you if you say a benevolent dictator is not going to work, you know that's sort of Frank Herbert's point. Well, what does work? Is it a is it a all powerful state? Um, you know, Orwell would suggest. That's not so good either, <laughs> you know. Um, is it a world where people are all? Let's pretend all want is destroyed, and everybody has all the spice they could want, and all the technology solves every problem. Mm -hmm. Does that turn us into uh, Sona sniffing or eating whatever it is, uh, useless creatures who lose the meaning of life? And you know, do we have to have struggle? What is it that, that propels humanity into the universe? And what? What is it that keeps us strong and keeps us going? And so these are all kinds of questions that that something like a Dune is trying to investigate. I wouldn't say that necessarily provides any answers to those questions, but it is at least thoroughly examining it. And there's all kinds of lines, particularly from the first book, that still moves people today. And you know, like fear is the mind killer. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, there's all kinds of quotable sections where Paul Atreides is 
is trying to rise up and become what he thinks he needs to become. Uh, and this is why I think the first book is so much more successful than, than everything that follows. Because before he gets too convoluted and trying to undermine these tropes and so on, he presents this heroic archetype, which people just love and identify with. And um, I did too, I was a young man. And I think particularly young men, when they're looking at Paul Atreides, they're, they're sort of, I don't know what the word is, but they're feeling identify, you know, identifying with this character and, and want him to succeed. And he does. Yeah, wildly so. He, he has that charisma. And, you know, of course, there's the whole, like you mentioned, the hero's journey with the fated bar premise. Like, you know, he, I don't know if it's the Ben Jesuit planted that seed or that was actually him that they were, he was prophesied to be. It's kind of like a mix of that. And I believe Frank Herbert never really clarifies that, which is what I like. You know, it's always left up to the viewer's discretion. Like, was he truly the savior or was he, did he just find out about it? And then he just, it, you know, and which of course brings historical parallels. And I, I know we want to talk about this as well, because there's the whole angle about, you know, Prophet Muhammad and how he, Islam, uh, uh, you know, came to rise in sixth century Arabia and how it followed through. So there's some fascinating parallels to that. We'll get to that. But what I do want to talk about, about also is like, you know, about your thoughts about what the publishing industry was at that moment, you know, in, during the 1960s, and how did this book change the genre of it? Because, you know, like we like we mentioned, like before this came the golden age of sci-fi, where, you know, there's Arthur C. Clarke, there was, uh, you know, uh, other 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 giants who had written their own books, but there, was, there wasn't really a series concept. There were mostly standalones, so they used to explore this brilliant idea, but perhaps not as charismatically, or their characterization wasn't as rich as to be found in Frank Herbert's, which perhaps also is do which his popularity rose but what are your thoughts about that yeah well i think this is a tricky subject first of all i'm i'm no scholar of the uh, publishing business from the 60s and 70s and so on so i i'm just sort of giving my own thoughts here but it seems to me that science fiction has always been small you know the famous works rise up and become uh sort of cultural mainstays but underneath all of those there's a whole bunch of things that just fail miserably and nobody's ever heard of them and so there's very few wildly successful science fiction works is my impression maybe somebody could disagree with that and i, I think that most people don't read much science fiction you know they only read the the big names they only re like once once something is bubbled up and people say oh this is the thing that everybody should read then people will read that but I, I don't think that there's a huge number of people who are constantly consuming science fiction. Uh, you know, we could look at the markets today, and I think that was true then too. I think it's always been true, and it might always be true forever. And why is that? Because science fiction is hard, right? Because it's hard to write and it's hard to read. It's it's presenting a complex view of human of the future of humanity. There's technological differences. You, you're telling people to move outside their comfort zone. You know, there's usually a slang, like the words have changed uh, because people of course are gonna speak differently in the future. And you're using purely your imagination for all this. So it's just like when people ask me um, when I, I write historical, quite historical fantasy, um, and I don't write historical fiction, but it, there's a reason for that. It's because it's very hard. It's hard to get any reader to move outside their cultural norm and to, to look at the world in a new way. And science fiction is almost required to do that because you're, you're moving into the future and therefore things are going to change. So you're trying to bring the reader along into this change and it's just hard to do that. So Dune is so successful in a way and Star Wars is so successful in a way, is because they are accessible. Despite the depth of Dune, despite it being very philosophical and all kinds of things, it it presents science fiction in a way. Well, for example, it takes away computers. It takes away machines in a way. So it makes it much more human. So it's more, it's easier for people to, to understand it without getting into the complexity of the technology, which is, you know, science fiction, it loses so many people as it starts talking about the, you know, warp drives and it's whatever it is. Most people are like, I don't understand and I don't care. Mm -hmm. So Dune doesn't do any of that, basically. It keeps the technology extremely grounded. It's, it's a peripheral subject. You know, the, the story is about people and it's about politics. 
And that's we all understand people in politics. We all yep. do that. We deal with that every day. You know, he's he's presented the universe as a, essentially a monarchy or an imperial empire. So mm -hmm. this is all something that's in human history. We understand that he's not presenting a new political system. No. He's not presenting uh, people really any differently than we would imagine them being in the past or in the present, uh, where the excesses or the strangeness of of monarchy is present for all to see and the, the excesses and the strangeness of the religions are there for all to see. And so it's just very approachable. So I, I would say that is what made it so successful in a nutshell. That plus it is, you know, it's good in all the ways that a story needs to be good, but it, it makes it accessible. Uh, definitely. So and I think you like correctly mentioned, like, you know, with all of its complexities and all of the things that made it successful, it also kind of was the first of its time, you know, it did things a little bit differently, like, you know, it had those potentially Islamic slash uh, Arabic influences, it had those words, and like you correctly mentioned, you know, because it took away the, the, the artificial intelligence and all the things, and I believe it's kind of referenced there in the books as well, like, there's the Butlerian Jihad, which kind of took place between the war between the man and machines, which is why they are like, shutting them away while they're still using it, but they're they're not making it so complicated so that it doesn't really come. And it's and all the fight scenes there with swords, maybe with guns, but it still came out on a level which we as, you know, in a current population can understand like what's what's happening or what's, you know, what's going on rather than it being with maybe say lightsabers or other fantastical yes. gadgets as well. One way I've heard this described for historical fiction in the past, something like a shogun, he familiarized the exotic. Mm -hmm. You know, he took this exotic sort of Middle Eastern culture, and he brought it into the European context, where you've got these you know, European medieval houses, essentially, the House yep. Atreides and House Harkonnen. And, you know, so that's all very familiar to the English speaking uh, reader, but he's brought in the, the Middle Eastern or the uh, context as well. So it's, mm -hmm. that's very exciting. And you know, just the opening statement that he's done such a good world building, Dune, Arrakis, desert planet. It's it's very the imagination just just leaps into it, right? So he's he's taken something, as I say, exotic and made it familiar, which is brilliant. It's it's extremely hard to do that. It seems so easy, right? When we when we look back on something like that with hindsight, we think, why didn't I think of that? You know, um, no, it's hard to do. Uh, definitely so and uh you're right about the houses because i believe i read somewhere that like house atreides is based on like a greek has it has origins in greece and harkonnen is based on its origins in either from the finnish or norwegian you know system because of course this is like ten thousand years into the future so you know they definitely had the beginnings from earth and that's how they kind of got forward with that uh, i want to talk to you more about like you know and this is something which we can talk about right now a little bit later but let's talk about the fact that you know he took away the machine concepts of it all. Like you know, there is no AIs, there's no machines. Now, that looking back at it, you know, it makes it's it, it's such a brilliant move that you know that he just had a quick line or two about like the Butlerian Jihad in the end, you know, and of course, which Kevin J. Anderson and his son, you know, of course, did many prequels, as they say about those as well. And we we won't talk about how successful or unnecessary or necessary they were, but that's a whole different concept. But from your perspective as a writer, because I do want to get this as a writer, because you write these complex stories as well. And you also have things where, you know, there's people are fighting with swords, people are fighting with now in your world, it's, you know, slowly, slowly inching towards maybe say, you know, guns. And in the future, as we see in the God Kings legacy, there are definitely guns being invented. From your perspective, how successful was that move? And do you think he did it intentionally or was it just like he found that like, during his writing process that he just happened to be like, oh yeah, this is the best move for this novel? I think he did it very intentionally. Um, as I say, for the exact reason that science fiction sort of alienates readers sometimes, he was trying to make it less science fiction. -y. And it's really hard to do that when you imagine computers, because you're really, keep in mind, he's writing back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. uh, so the future of computers at that time, they had no idea where it was gonna go, right? And so to, to try and make that leap, to try and understand where it's going to go, you almost, you date yourself. You, you make yourself irrelevant very quickly mm -hmm. by being wrong, right? Yep. Um, and so I think it was a very intelligent move to try and just completely get it out of the way because he's thinking, look, rather than try and figure out what the cell phones of the future are going to look like or if people are going to have, um, you know, 
technology built into their bodies or whatever it is that, that people are going to do in the future. He just thought, no, nope, I'll just ban it. I'll ban mm-hmm. it throughout the universe. Problem solved. Now, if you think about it very carefully, it's like, well, how in the hell are these starships working, you know, without computers? And But that's a modern sort of understanding in a way. Um, back then, people thought, well, we have machines and they don't work with computers. And so uh, it makes sense to us. Mm-hmm. Does it make sense to a modern person who's sending a starship out? No, it does not. But it worked. It worked for the book. I don't think anybody could get away with it today um, because I think nobody could suspend their disbelief enough. Like we'd think, no, no computers in this incredible. How could you ban it? Some guy would create computers on one of their worlds and he'd conquer the universe with his computers because you guys don't can't stop it. So they, they have these mentats that they they have the human computer sort of that they that is his solution. And it's a brilliant mm-hmm. solution and it works very well for the book. And I, it's one of the almost underexplored things. I wish he'd almost gone into these mentats more. Maybe, he, I guess he sort of does in the later books, but, but a brilliant thing. And uh, yeah, I think it, yeah, I think it worked wonderfully. And what can I say? He's, he's got a variety of things like that, that, that just are, are brilliant moves. They definitely are. Like, you know, the Mentat Society, the Ben Gesserits, the, the Fremen, the Spice World, you know, how it kind of affects them mentally and even the physiological changes, like, you know, the people of Fremen, they have blue eyes and all of that. Those are all like these brilliant small touches which kind of help develop the world as well. And talking about the world development, I want to ask your opinion about like, because when you read it, you know, of course, when you were a young person, you read it, you, you were exposed to these ideas and he uses like, and I know that you have talked, spoken about this previously as well. Like, you know, there is, he uses a certain thing, you know, there is the Islamic influence or the Arabic influence. So you can talk about that. And I want to hear your opinion about that. But the key of it all is that the House Harkonnen as well as House Atreides are going to Arrakis. So there's this whole, and there are people living over there, which they basically discount. They Now, of course, Harkonnens have a much brutal way of dealing with them. Atreides wants to kind of develop a more congeal relationship where they can, you know, support them and they can get their help as well. Now, in this natives versus outsider debate or like, you know, this concept, what would you think, you know, or what would you say, like, how was he developed or what are your thoughts about just this whole, the basic conflict of this, of the novel of the first, of the first book, at least? Yeah, well, I, I think he does it very well in that, in a way, the people who live on Arrakis, the natives, whatever you want to call them, are, are irrelevant, you know, mm-hmm. to, to all of the people with power which is exactly how human beings operate. You know, wherever you go in the world, um, for the most part, unfortunately, I guess you could say, it's really only power that, that moves people to care about you. Mm-hmm. You know, if you, if you have no ability to harm them, if you have no benefit to them, if you've got nothing to offer them as far as they, they can tell, you sort of don't matter. Um, and it's only, well, we guess we could discuss different philosophies of human beings, but there are, o- there are only a few different philosophies that human beings have ever produced, which give anybody any kind of va- inherent value. You know, Christianity is one, mm-hmm. Islam is one that you have to convert. Um, yeah. So there, there are ways to wrap you into the group and to give you some value. But for the most part, and this is true of nature, uh, especially anything that's not a human. So we give ourselves a hard time, but this is the way that nature works. So we, we shouldn't think of ourselves too harshly. We're the only ones who seem to overcome it. If you have nothing to offer, um, you are just trod upon by the strong. You know, The, the strong just kind of eat the weak. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a sad reality, but that is how it's portrayed in Dune. So not until the denizens of Arrakis actually can can withhold you know they can stop the production of spice or they can destroy the production of spice it's not until they um leverage that yeah. are they given any sort of attention by the by the greater powers that is true uh you re- you raise a certain fascinating point about like you know the the colonial history of mankind as well and this is not just based on the recent his uh recent past but if you go back thousands of years no matter what the culture was, no matter which continent you're focusing on, there is always 
a colonial power rises, be it the, the Mongols, be it, you know, you know, of course, the more recent European powers, but even before that, even when, you know, maybe we did not have that much history. So even when the land was focalized, there usually was rising one empire or one kingdom, which would then overpower the rest. And then of course, conquer their territory. And of course they did it in various degrees. Maybe the Mongols were the most brutal of them all, which is why we kind of remember them with such, and the Huns and everybody remember them with such not fondness, but that to that degree, that's absolutely true. Uh, you also bring up a fascinating point that human beings are the only ones who are trying to correct that. And you bring up a fascinating example of Christianity because I believe, you know, when Christianity was starting out, the, the way Jesus' teachings were being pro provided to, and that's why maybe it was the conversion factor was so good because they kind of looked upon like the poor and the meek, they will you know easily get to heaven. And that's kind of like, and we of course don't want to get into that because there's a whole theological debate, but I do agree with that. Like there was that message of like, you know, hey, if you are powerless, God loves you. If you are powerless, the son of God is your champion and so on and so forth. Yes, well, I think I think Dune inspires some at least theological adjacent discussion because you know, as as Herbert's Arab friend said, he was like, "No, it's a religious uh, text almost. It's a religious thought." So you sort of at least have to be adjacent to it. And again, it goes to what I was saying about trying to get people to understand outside of their own context, outside of their own culture. We take it as a given today that that a human being has inherent value, right? We think, we think, you know, that is just how the modern culture in the Anglo sphere, anybody who's listening to us who speaks English or, you know, in the European context or in many other contexts, most of contexts in the world today, but not all, we should be yeah. clear about that. Yeah. We, we, our cultures believe that human beings have inherent value, that yeah. human life and indeed all life has some value. Well, that is not true of human human cultures of the past it is not a given mm -hmm. you know you have to do a variety of intellectual work to get there yeah so you know most human beings had slavery in the past and today we look at that and we think well that's obviously evil mm -hmm. it, it's evil to have a slave because a slave has inherent value and you are diminishing it well if you live in a culture that does not believe that people have inherent value and that that person has as much value as a clump of dirt or a rat or anything else it doesn't affect you at all to think of them as a slave and and so they they don't exist in the same category maybe as your kin or your culture or whatever it is so but but to convince a modern reader that that's truly how other people have believed you know it wasn't pretend they didn't do that just to get their evil way they yeah. really did believe that and, and that's true of the culture in Dune, where that these, this House Harkonnen, or maybe the Emperor, many of these people, when they look at the citizens of Arrakis, they think of them as absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. they're, they're just in the way, or they're, and, and this incredibly rich resource exists on their planet, but it has nothing to do with them. Yeah. And so they are to be wiped out, or to be uh, enslaved, or anything else to get it. And so, yeah, you're right. They, they, they're thought of more as impediments rather than, you know, being helpful artifacts. They're just thought of being into impediments to the spice or impediments to, to the Harkonnen way of life or the Padishas, the Padishas way of life. Uh, yes. That is a fascinating, and you are right, because maybe it's in the last only 200, 300 years, there was this cultural enlightenment, you know, across the Anglosphere and thankfully uh, due to the Anglosphere, it slowly started spreading to the societies of course, still not entirely in the world that, you know, an inherent human life is still a valuable one. And even if a person is born, maybe they're of a different skin or anything like that, they still have the same, they should we give the same respect as anybody else as well. That's true. Or that they have uh, any kind of right or that, you know, that they've got the, a right to not be imprisoned or killed or that they have uh, the freedom of speech or the freedom of mobility or the freedom to own this land which their ancestors have dwelt upon for, in the case of Arrakis, who knows how long. They don't care, right? They don't care about any of that. And, and again, that is true to history. It's true to life. You know, does a, does a lion care the rights of the antelope? You know, no. Um, so we, human beings give ourselves a hard time about this, but I would suggest we are the only living creature we've ever discovered who at least do sometimes give someone a, a pre-existing right. And other species as well, other species too, because human beings are definitely yes. caring about other species yes. too, like other, which are going extinct or trying to stop the extinction. Okay, 
Uh, shifting a little bit more, I want to talk more about, like, since we, you touched upon so many theological angles, I want to talk about the Islamic angle. And specifically, I want to talk about, you know, the whole parallel Paul has with Prophet Muhammad and the rise of Islam. Mm -hmm. uh, there's too many coincidences, like, you know, of course, the language and the terms, like, you know, the, the, the Padisha, which is, of course, an Islamic term for an emperor, the term Jihad, which is, of course, the struggle within and the struggle without, you know, to shed, to gain enlightenment, if, if you want to speak of that. There's also both Paul and, of course, now Paul and Muhammad don't have the same backgrounds. You know, Muhammad was just a trade a trader who came from like a normal background. He gained enlightenment, so as to speak. But Paul, in this way, because it's the you know it's a, it's a story, he gains. He's also possibly has genetic, uh, you know, genetically been enhanced by his mother's upbringing as well as from his father's side. And then, of course, the spice which he gets, you know, elevates him and his conscience or his. Uh, intellect to a whole another level. But talking about the whole parallels between Muhammad's ascent and the whole ascent of Islam, and of course the new uh, Masiha, as they like to call him, and of course there's a term which you use, and I, I apologize, I cannot, uh, the quasi hadith, or they definitely call him something like that. I, was I, that Hadarach or uh, was it Hadarach, something like that? And they definitely call him Muadib, I believe, uh, which is also the term for like a leader, something like that, and I, I might be getting that wrong. But there's these the Freeman terms, which of course echo. Islamic language or Middle Eastern language. Now, what, what do you think, sir? Like, you know, what would you say about the, the whole battles between Muhammad and Paul? Yeah, oh, it's obviously there. Um, writers always draw from these, these archetypes, these, uh, you know, whatever the actual story of Muhammad's real life, though it is documented pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, there's always the reality and then there's the myth. You know, and, and same thing with Jesus or same thing with any of the mythological slash prophetic slash religious figures of human history. They're built into these figures that are greater than any man could be, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, but but yes, Paul follows that. And Herbert, again, is doing that very intentionally. And and you can see sort of in the context of what he was trying to do with the don't don't get too um worshiping of a hero don't don't blindly follow these leaders he is showing that there are myths being made about paul even before he arrived right that the mm -hmm. bene Gesserit are are producing the conditions they are teaching essentially these religious tenets mm -hmm. to prepare the people for the prophet yep so it's not just that the prophet comes and then the prophet or the uh, the legends build around him no the legends are pre-produced mm -hmm. and so they are just waiting to be exploited, essentially. And so, you know, I'm, I guess I, I'm not necessarily trying to bring a, um, a parallel between Muhammad or any of the other human prophecy or prophets of, of culture, but there is an element of that yep. where these religious tenets or these religious beliefs produce a, a vulnerability. They prepare mm -hmm. people for a prophet to come along yep and so it seems like to them our myth is coming alive but if they didn't have the myth and the man you know the the thing is the person can learn about your myth and i i did this in my own books uh where where ruka has learned of these old gods and these um, you know this, these people's beliefs and he exploits their beliefs mm -hmm. by saying i am a new prophet and here are my um, from us. Yep. Yes. And, you know, these things you've heard are wrong because I have the word of God. And, mm -hmm. and, and so these people who are just waiting to hear someone come along and say exactly what he's saying, uh, gravitate to him and, and launch into whatever he tells them to do. So that's similar to Paul. You could say that that's similar to, to Muhammad and that's similar to Jesus. And that's where these, uh, for whatever reason, and, you know, I'm, I'm always, I, I don't like to, to denigrate religion. It's, I'm never in the business of doing that. Mm -hmm. I, especially because I think human beings are fundamentally uh, spiritual religious creatures and will never be able to get away from it. So to denigrate it is to have a poor argument, let's say. Yep. Um, but we are, it is one of the human foibles yep. that we are, all, maybe we're, because we're pattern seeking. I'm not sure what it is. But we're always looking for that. We're looking for the stars to align. You know, 
We want mm -hmm. our beliefs to match our behaviors to match the reality. Yep. And um, so that is something that Herbert is playing with. It's very interesting to watch. And uh, I think he does a, I think he does a great job. And I think it's really clever because for the most part, people in the West and who speak English, they don't know that much about Muhammad and they don't know that much about Islam. And so he can, he can use that um, and, and introduce it almost as if he's created it in a way. Yep. No, you're, you're absolutely right. We are not, uh, and I didn't mean to bring up this question to kind of doubt, you know, Muhammad's ascent or the, the religion of Islam. It's not, you, you correctly highlighted this, like, you know, it's a neurological fallacy amongst human beings to kind of want to believe in something more, to want to be. That's why there's so many myths. Like you go to any corner of the world, yes. no matter what religion they're practicing right now, there will always be this geographical mythology, which has been, which has existed for thousands of years. Uh, while the, and of course, there's the whole human foible angle. Like, you know, we want to believe in someone who can come and save us. The savior complex is true. That has been true throughout the ages, which is why we have so many stories of saviors and even prophesied saviors, which are supposedly, hopefully, she will come. I can speak as, you know, amongst Hindu mythology, there is the 10th incarnation of Vishnu, which is supposed to arrive anytime now. I don't know when that will happen, if it'll happen. What uh, happens when it happens? Are we all doomed, basically? Kind of. Like, he's the same. He's the 10th incarnation and the last incarnation. And he arrives, I think, holding an umbrella on a horse. And then he's that's supposedly going he's going to roll through the age to so the end. So as uh, I don't know if you or the viewers know this, but there's like four ages in uh, Hindu mythology. And we are right now in Kali Yuga, which is a dark age. And well, so you coming. know very well, sir, that I have read the Mahabharata. <laughs> yes, I do. Yes, I do. And I'm so glad for that. But yeah, the Mahabharata, when technically it started or when it ended, the, the whole epic was when the Kali Yuga, the fourth age or the last dark age started. And Kalki, the 10th avatar of Vishnu, is supposedly going to end this age. And then, of course, we go back to Hindu mythology is cyclical. It says, like, you know, these right. ages cycle throughout. But now, coming back to this whole point, you know, I, I don't want to say that, you know, that you are denigrating or anybody we are, if by me asking the question is denigrating any religion or any prophet. But it is just bringing a lot of historical parallels. And it, it's kind of fascinating to see that. Uh, yeah. And like you mentioned, you know, there's the after books also explore that, like, you know, how much. A Paul's religion spells like wildfire, not just in Arrakis, but to different different planets. And you also, I think you also mentioned that trillions of people die. And I believe that's number somewhere between 50 to 80 billion or so because of his jihad and the Freeman's belief in him that it it spreads and it causes so much life and death. But of course, the eventual goal of Paul is to save humanity by killing a lot of people. Again, historical parallels. Well, and he he's afraid of what will happen. You know, he's He's pointing out the fear of the hero worship and the, the, this prophecy mm -hmm. as much as anyone, you know, it's just that he can't control it in a way, yeah. you know, it gets out of his hands and it's the universe is too large and he's just one guy. And um, so, you know, maybe if he had a, if he had these computers that they're so afraid of, maybe if he had a way to, you know, put, extend his voice onto every planet, to every person at the same time, he could stop these things from happening. But um Anyways, very interesting. That is true. You also, and uh, I, 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 I need to diverge for a little bit from our topic of Dune to a little bit because you kind of explore this also within your novels. You explore the same fascinating concept of, you know, like Ruka after the events of the Child, Ashen's Hand trilogy, his fame has spread not only throughout his land of ash, but through the lands of, you know, sand and the islands and Nara and beyond. Like people know of him. People either hero worship him or people are deathly scared of him, both of which are rightly true at the same time. And at the beginnings of the, the next book of yours, Dark Sea Ends, you, you know, because he's not given a POV, you get to see both angles from different, different people or different, different POV characters. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, about this insane need of humans to hero worship, but also at the same time, you know, people not being able to control their own image once it is out there, once their deeds are well known? Yeah, well, I, maybe I'd pull it back. So you, hero worship is, a, is an element of it. Mm -hmm. But I think what every religion has learned throughout human history is that sort of like Frank Herbert has learned, or maybe I, I think every writer should know, is that what you are trying to do is not the same as what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And also, once you've written the book, or once you've made the holy text, or once you've created a legend for yourself, you don't own it. You know, other people are going to read your book and look at your holy text and they're going to interpret it and they're going to come to their own conclusions. And unless you have a political structure, which is then to follow your religious structure, 
where you say, all right, this is the belief and anybody who deviates from the belief gets their head chopped up. You know, then you can align the two with, with quite a bit of tyranny and, yep. and law. Mm -hmm. But if you don't do that, then people will just take your text and you take your religion or take your example, and they're just going to run off in a direction that you couldn't have even imagined. And, and so religions split apart and become 15 different religions or states split apart or culture splits apart. Heroes who say, you know, what makes me heroic is I did X. And somebody says, what makes you heroic is you did Y. Mm -hmm. And he says, no, 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 Y was just incidental. I, you know, it was because I did it and no, nope, they don't care. They take it and they, they do their own thing. So for ill or for, for good, you know, human beings are independent creatures with their own minds and they will interpret the world however they want and things change and you just can't control it. And mm -hmm. whatever, as I say, what every religion, what every writer, what every government has learned, well, maybe not learned, but they are faced <laughs> with the reality of throughout mm -hmm. human history is that you do not control all the people all the time mm -hmm. um they will they will go their own way they will rebel they will interpret it differently and it's just very interesting a topic to explore and some of the great figures of history and you know ruka in my book or paul atreides and dune or you can go down the list yeah um sometimes watch sometimes they live that usually they die and they don't miss some you know they don't see it but if they live long enough they will watch their own legacy um torn apart manipulated um expanded upon misinterpreted changed by other people and usually all they can sort of do is shake their heads and and they, be, they usually become more philosophical in their old age you know they're very confident when they're young Mm -hmm. this is what they're doing and they're going to change the world and, and then they watch the consequences and they think all right maybe it just you just can't do it maybe is was it worth it i don't know but but it's a fascinating process though i think i'm fascinated with, with these great people because i think they often do change the world even if they don't change it quite in the way they intended um it doesn't mean they didn't change it and yep. it doesn't mean they didn't change it for good yep changes so change yeah. Yes, yes. But I think we have to be humble. You know, that's one thing that, that people should always do, whether they're, um, you know, a blacksmith or a conqueror or a data analyst, is just remember a little bit of humility. Uh, that, that no matter what you do, you're a mortal creature, you're going to die, and new people are going to take up the reins. And, uh, you know, they're not even going to remember your name in 100 years. It's sort of Ozymandias. <laughs> king of kings look on my works ye mighty in despair also what you just described brings a line from the dark knight movie you know you either die a hero or you live long enough to become a villain that kind of yeah. you know summarizes nicely the viewing point as well and that's true because you know ultimately once your legacy is out there you have no control over it and which paul learns to his great detriment you know that and ruka is seeing a bit of that but like you said he's trying to control that because he's also scary at the same time yeah and I, maybe it's because maybe the difference between Herbert and I is that he's a, a harsher critic of man than I am. You know, he's saying, look at all the terrible things that is the result of these actions. Whereas I look at it and I think, but still look at the success. You know, I don't know. You, you can't get away from the darker deeds of, of mankind or, or just the living creatures. You know, to eat, you have to kill, mm -hmm. right? If you're a carnivore. Um, but what are you supposed to do? Are you, are you going to lay true. down and die? You know, that is true. Uh, which side point there's also, of course, the whole, uh, there's a religion called Jainism and it probably, I think you might've heard of it. They, they kind of go take this to the exact extreme of, they believe that, you know, by living, you're not supposed to harm any being or any, uh, sentient thing, so which includes even microbes. So they, they kind of cover their face. They don't eat. Yes. Uh, oh, the you know, genes, yes. Yes, they don't eat fruits and things from below the earth because you know, when you approve them, you're killing particles and matter from the soil. So that's another whole extreme. And that's maybe, like you said, a topic for another time. But yes, there are humanity can go in strange ways. And of course, there's the whole concept of evolution. But I do want to talk to you about this because you have mentioned this a lot of times all this while is the accessibility of the text. You know, Dune, even though it explores these complex concepts. There is this nihilism at its heart. It's a hero's journey. It's about this, you know, outsider versus uh, the people who are living over there, the colonialism, all of that. 
but at the same time, it is very, very, very accessible that, you know, and would you care to talk a little bit more about that? And I, I would love to hear from your author viewpoint, you know, because you're, as a reader, you and I can maybe talk, but as an author, you have that extra insight about how to make it accessible. I don't know if I have any extra insight, but uh, yes, I know what you mean. How, so you're sort of asking, how did he do it? How did he yep. make it so accessible? I think we've talked about this a little bit already, but, but there are different words for them, tropes, archetypes. He is relying heavily on some of them, right? So that's one way. That's how you, you, you take things that are familiar to people and then you expand upon them. So, you know, people are always asking, why are there coming of age stories? Why is the, why is the uh, hero always from this backwoods uh, village? And then he's the chosen one and uh, he rises up and becomes this. Well, that's because they, they are starting simply. Mm -hmm. They want to start the hero in a little village that's easy to explain. Um, this you can learn all the details of very quickly. That's why that's done because uh, same thing with coming of age i want to start when the kid is 12 years old so that he's he's innocent and mm -hmm. we get to know him very well and we see his childhood and we know everything about him so that when he becomes a 30 year old tyrannical conqueror we see how he got from 12 to 30 and we are taken along that journey and the sort of the opposite this is this is maybe we can bring in the malazan or the malazan yeah uh, difference malazan is is exact opposite of that mm -hmm. malazan says rather than drop you in gently into this uh single character or to take a game of thrones um you know to introduce you to the starks you know to to introduce you to this vast complex world through these few characters that you can learn to know and understand and get to know their world instead malazan will throw you you know face first into the deep end where yeah. everything's already complicated and you're just sort of holding on for dear life as you try and as you try and understand it. Well, the reason Malzan will never be as successful as Dune, my apologies to Mr. Erickson, <laughs> is, is because of that. Um, yep. Because Frank Herbert holds your hand a little bit, even though he introduces some complexity, he, he is bringing you in through the point of view of these characters. And um, you get to know them and you get to know their struggles and you're on board and, and you care about this family going to Arrakis and you, you feel the anxiety. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a very personal story. Um, even though it's third person and it's omniscient for Christ's mm -hmm. sake, you know, it's, which is extremely hard to do. Um, it's, it's a personal story. Whereas Malzahn is not a personal story. It's very impersonal. You don't know who to cheer for. You are, you know who you're cheering for in Doom, right? It's very yep. clear. Oh yeah, there is, there is, there is no ambiguity there. Uh, you, you, thank you for saying that. And again, no offense to Malazan fans, but Malazan truly isn't for everyone. Uh, I have flamed out of the after after book five because I could not make head or sense of the tale. And no, I will not be restarting again because book seven is where it all makes sense. You're absolutely well, right about the fact that. Yeah, well, there are people who love that style of story, but they're, you know, one in a hundred. Mm -hmm. I would say even who, one in 10,000, not even one in a hundred. Yeah, yeah, sure. Whatever, whatever the number is, it's a small number. If it was one in 10,000 who like that, the mm -hmm. people who like one in Dune is one in a hundred. Yeah. You know, there's just way more people who can identify with that personal style, uh, ease you into it a bit more story um, than, than can empathize. And then if it's one in a hundred for Dune, it's one in 50 for Star Wars. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, the pop one of my theories about Star Wars popularity is, and this is kind of like you know completely out there, is that I think that because America is such a young nation, you know, or the Western world, if not the European worlds, but the Western nations, it's such a young nation that it does not have a mythological past. Mm. And Star Wars came in and gave this easy mythology of good versus evil, Jedi's and the Sith Lords, and there's swords and there's people flying and stuff like that. So that's why it caught on. And I could be wholly wrong about this, but your thoughts? We, we could talk about that subject for um, another hour or so. You know, it <laughs> might get you into Neil Gaiman and American gods and, um, and the loss of religious mythology and the constant seeking for new mythology. And, you know, you may <laughs> notice that the most popular thing is superheroes these days. Well, what is that if not the modern recreation of, you know, Greek gods? And yep. so... Yes, people are story 
They're narrative-based creatures. I do what I do because mm-hmm. I believe that fundamentally human beings are narrative-based creatures. Yeah. And you might ask, well, why? You know, we think we're so rational. We think we're so objective. Well, when we look out at the world, what do we see? Do you see electrons and neutrons and protons? No. Mm-hmm. Okay, you do not see reality. You see a curated version of reality based on your brain trying to interpret it as quickly and efficiently as possible. And the way that human beings have done that is through storytelling, mm-hmm. um, through, through interpreting reality as efficiently as possible. That's how we see the reality. And, and so that we're never going to get away from that. Storytelling is how we interpret reality. Mm-hmm. And writers do it. Um, religious figures do it. Any, anyone does it who is trying to communicate with another human being. And it's funny, even in companies these days, they're starting to hire um, you know, chief storytelling officers <laughs> instead, of, instead of communicators. You know, it's so funny to me to see that. Um, because because of, if you're a clever leader, mm-hmm. you grasp intuitively that the way to communicate to other people is to tell them stories. Mm-hmm. And if you read some of the most popular uh, nonfiction, um, I'm trying to think of maybe who are the best ones to use. Exam- Who's that uh, American with the big hair? Um, Steve Pinker? Steve, Pinker's one. Um, I, he's a good example too. But another one I was thinking of is the uh, Zero to One. The uh, Oh, Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah, yeah, yeah Malcolm Gladwell. Yep. Uh, um, if you read Malcolm Gladwell, everything starts with a story. Yep. Um, that is how he introduces whatever academic topic he's about to get to yeah introduces it with let me tell you a story yeah so so that that is human beings for you and um i don't know anecdote no no that that makes absolute sense the anecdote at the in the middle or the start or something like that because his books and i'm forgetting his most his most popular book oh dear god why can't i uh something ology or something like that that, not outsiders um it's his most I, famous I know book. What book it is. Yes. Yeah, because it's, it's he's even did a sequ- sequel to it, and it, it, it it's really fascinating. And oh, oh dear God, I'm gonna kick myself. I'll come Outliers. Us, but... Outliers. Outliers is one. There's also something else which is like I'm trying to think of, which was like really popular. It's like his most. Uh... Oh, I thought Outliers was a big one. I could be wrong though. No, no, you you're right about that. It's I'm trying. To, it's something to do with Ology or. Ah, oh, why can't I think of that? This is, this is going to drive us both mad until we Google it. I know. I am just trying to do that. And Sorry, people listening to us. We uh, <laughs> tipping point. Is that it? Ah, uh, maybe. All right, I give up. I give it's up. definitely outliers. It's a David Goliath one as well. And oh, it's you know what I think. I thought of. I I attributed another book to him. It's uh, something else. Which uh, it's something Ology. Oh, never mind. Coming back to the <laughs> okay, right. point, it'll it'll come to me after we stop recording. Yeah. Uh, okay. That was that was really fascinating. You know the whole concept of like you know how accessible it is and how uh, the anti on it is in in a way. I do want to lastly talk about like you know the adaptation part because we kind of hinted about it in the start. You know when you talked about the fact that Herbert himself wrote the screenplay and the French director was just like hands up, could not do it. There have been, I believe, two movie adaptations. One was in 1984, David Lynch one, and of course the more recent one, uh, you know, from Warner Bros, uh, which was kind of adapted only part of the like the first book of Dune. I would love to hear your thoughts. Uh, I know you're a fan. You meant, have mentioned you have seen both of them as well as some of the sci-fi TV series as well, which didn't focus on the books, but the sequels as well. But just would love to hear what you thought about all of them. Yeah, well, maybe I should start by saying that I, I'm not one of these people who says, oh, I saw the movie and it wasn't as good as the book. It's terrible. I'm not like that at all. I, um, I see them as different mediums. And so they are just completely different. Mm-hmm. And whenever anybody makes a TV show or movie of a book that I enjoy, I think, awesome, thanks very much. I'm gonna go enjoy this content that I love in this new medium. Thanks for all your work, full stop. I really don't have much else to say when in terms of criticism. So I enjoyed all the Dune movies. I've seen them all. I even watched the, the t- made for TV series as well. I enjoyed those. But I, as I watched them, I just, I just shake my head thinking, God, this is so hard. Like trying to turn this material into a movie is so difficult. And it, it's not, not that easy for me to say why 
I guess, other than it's so, because it is such a personal philosophical work and there's so much complexity, the, the plot is actually very simple. Yep. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, um, the hero journey. Relatively simple. It's sort of, uh, you know, the guy goes out into the desert, and makes his tribe and takes over the planet and that's it. Mm-hmm. I mean, that there's a lot of complexity to get there, but, but it's a fairly straightforward uh, story. So in a way, I think when directors see that, they think, oh yeah, I could do this. Um, but then they start getting into the details and it's like, well, what is it that makes Dune, Dune? And uh, once you start to realize that it's the themes and the philosophy and so on, it's like, how do I capture this? And, and the way the story is told, much of it is told through thinking. Yeah. You know, you're in Paul's head, you're in the character's head. It's not necessarily through dialogue. And so it's like, well, how do I do it? Do I have him say it out loud? The one movie, it literally has the character's thoughts um, overlaying the scenes, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, in, in the newest movie, it's very silent. It is, yeah. You know what I mean? There's not yeah. a lot of, uh, of dialogue. And, and so if you're a Dune fan, if you've read the books and so on, I think it works pretty well because you, you know, right? Like, oh yeah, I remember this. I know what's going on. But I think if you're not a Dune fan, you're probably kind of lost. You're kind of, you're probably thinking, well, this is a bit slow. And, um, you know, why isn't it, you know, more happening? And so it's just really hard. And anyone who tries to turn a, a book into a movie, God bless them. You know, it's, it's, it's just difficult. And there's some books that are really easily translatable, mm-hmm. but for the most part, what they have to do is come up with their own version. They have yes. to change things. They have to change things. And it's really, I shake my head whenever I watch the fans who are watching the sh- show or the movie thinking, they changed X, Y, Z, those sons of bitches. And I'm like, they have to. They can't. It cannot be like it is in the books. Now, not to say that they don't make all kinds of foolish changes and, just, and, yep. and stupid mistakes that didn't need to be done. And and so fair enough but but it's really hard it's really hard to do i can't imagine it is and of course like you mentioned there are some books which are adaptations are a little bit easier uh some books of course dune for one uh shogun for another uh game of thrones before it was adapted into the you know uh or sorry a song of ice and fire before it's adapted into tv show t game of thrones because originally when people and i think i read an interview with george r R. martin who said this like you know people were pitching movie ideas to him but they're removing the whole cast of characters they were like let's just have some john snow and danny or maybe have to in for the comedy effect and he was like no that loses its complexity so it kind of brings to your point as well uh with the new movie though i want to highlight one thing you know uh uh, i don't know if you have seen denny Villeneuve, the director his previous movies as well you know he has done a lot of thriller movies and he does this like you know he doesn't really show what's going on the character's head he just shows like there's you'll see this even in the dune movie there's a lot of background sounds which are going on like you know with of course with the soundtrack and everything so it kind of heightens the scene and you're also kind of pushed along as to not knowing what's going to happen uh sicario a film of his is an excellent example of this you know it kind of is deals with a lot more real world complexity uh but it has the same similar moments of you know like the, the characters in there they're often silent. They're, they don't talk a lot. They do talk, but a lot of action scenes are just, you know, through the character's eyes and you're just not able to see, not able to figure out what's happening. Or at least you get, until you you get to see it as well. Well, just a quick fan uh, question. Between the 1984 movie and between the 2021 movie, which one would you, was your favorite and why? Oh, that's interesting. You know, I'm not even sure. I, I guess... I mean, the, it's so hard. That's so unfair almost to the 1984 because just the visuals, the, mm-hmm. the visuals and the, the, the worm and the technology and all that in the new movie is unbelievable. I mean, so that's, that's my favorite part of the new movie is the, the visuals. Yeah. Um, and to just see that come to life as a, I, I think even though I'm really a, imagination based creature and I don't necessarily need to see things on film from books I, you know, I I imagine in my mind and sometimes when you see something shown by someone else it, it doesn't live up to the expectation you've got in your mind I would say if, if the newest movie not only is that not true it exceeds it you know I don't think my brain has the capacity to visually create mm-hmm. uh, what is created in that movie um, so that's about as high a praise as I can possibly give it 
having said that, the old movie, in a way, does a better job of actually presenting the Dune story mm -hmm. um, and, and per, you know, bringing the thoughts of the characters to life and, and, and all the rest of it. But yeah, it just can't compete because it's done in the eighties. You know, it yep. just it has to do things in a way which is of their time, and even of their time, I think the way that the director went was kind of wonky. You know, he was he was presenting things in a way that I don't know what the right word is for it. Hackneyed. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> there was a bit of it, there know, was a there, bit of camp to the movie. Like there, there yeah, was a bit yeah, of corny was. and campy nature to the movie as well. But, like, but it was okay. And I liked, I really liked the Baron, you mm -hmm. know, for example, I think maybe people would disagree with that from the eighties movie, but I, I don't know. I, they did, they did a perfectly adequate job. I, I like both, but the, the technology that permits is, you know, in the modern movie making is just so unbelievable when they have a big budget like that. It's just crazy. It was, and it was also, uh, I was just uh, trying to think of it, it was separate by nearly 35, 40 years. That's yeah. a whole bunch of time for technology to leap ahead, especially considering how it has moved up ahead. And to be fair to the old view, the newer movie only presents half of the book. Like technically there's True. a sequel coming uh, where they're going to explore the second half where yeah. you know, I think it is two years later of what happens two years later and how Paul gets his win. So yeah, we're yeah, kind of comparing, okay. you're kind of comparing like half. So, my question yeah. wasn't really fair to you, but still, I wanted to hear like well, what your thoughts were. I'd, I'd almost forgotten that until you said it. Um, you know, with the I, new movie, they, they because they don't, they only show half the movie. In a way, it's a problem. You know, I, it's like again, if you're new to, if you've never read the books, you're just like, what the hell was that? How's it? <laughs> how's it over? It doesn't make sense. Uh, and but again, you're working within the limitations of the medium. It's like, look, guys. I can't keep people in their seats for four hours. Mm -hmm. I can't do it. I got to break it up. <laughs> There's no songs, you know. That's what the no that's the genius of Bollywood. You know, it gives you songs that people can just skip out, get some food to eat, go to the oh, bathroom. Yeah, yeah. So that's so true. maybe clever ways around this this limitation. You know, what isn't Zack Snyder's? Uh, oh, whatever. Justice League. Yep. Four hours. That, is, that was four hours and one minute. I mean, uh, thankfully, we, you know, you could see it at home. So you can always, I watched it in parts. Like, there's no way I could watch the entire thing in one go. You know, in a way, I think this is a limitation of the theater thinking. Mm -hmm. Because most people watch movies in the comfort of their home these days. They can just mm -hmm. pause it and get up and walk away. Yeah. So I, maybe in the future, when they, we stop thinking in terms of movie theaters, um, maybe they will make movies that last four hours. And they're just like, look, you can pause it whenever you want. Hollywood really hates that though, because for them it's all about the theater business. I, know. I mean, that model is changing, yeah. and Netflix has forced them to change it that way because now, thanks to all the streaming services, yeah, could they could release the whole uh, four-hour movie of Zack Snyder, and it was you could watch in parts. I know of people like I know of a fan in India uh, whom I've gotten talking like he watched the entire movie on repeat, like he watched it in one go, and then he watched it again the, the next morning as well. I was like, kudos to you. Huh. You obviously does not have children, so that makes sense too. <laughs> Well, the model, the model that's broken this is the, the TV series that yeah. you watch, but still they're forcing the time constraint of, you know, an hour mm -hmm. or whatever. So, so they're saying, you know, if you do that, you've got to have a beginning and a middle and end to this hour. And it, so maybe that's not the worst idea in the world because it's sort of like presenting chapters. Yeah. Uh, so it works, it works, but one I wonders just, in the future if if we are going to get into longer movies just because people are watching them at home anyways. I mean, it, it makes sense because there's no ads, you know, like you don't have to, because a lot of like what you mentioned, the TV networks, besides the hour, they were also constrained by the number of ads they had to put in. Like, you know, you can only have like 42 minutes or 41 minutes. And sometimes it's that crucial difference of a minute or two, which can will affect that story or the screenplay from becoming great to maybe a moderate one. So there's, of course, that one as well. And of course, now with the golden age of sci-fi and fantasy upon us i'm hoping that you know maybe more streamers can look at besides the popular novels other stories which are out there which are not as popular but would be great to adapt as well so that would be definitely be fantastic yeah um, all one needs to know to see the um, the damaging influence of time constraints is to watch uh, game of thrones from <laughs> it's like this is when they had all the time in the world yep. and this is when they didn't yep <laughs> oh, that is definitely a talk for another time because you cannot 
there's just so much in you know invectives that you can give to the producers especially dan and db wise for ruining possibly the greatest show and even when the author was there to tell them like he would have gladly wanted it to you know because i think george R. 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 martin is on record that he wanted 10 seasons of 10 episodes each and i distinctly remember reading uh an interview with them in the start where they had said that if if they follow the original time plot line of george's books and his original series plan it was going to take them anywhere between 80 to 90 se- 80 to 90 episodes which roughly translates to about 8 to 9 seasons of you know 80 to 90 episodes and they ended it with 73 which is obviously the worst thing that they could have done and of course all of mostly all the whole world agrees with with the, us about that all right yeah. before i let you go i just want to get a quick uh, thoughts about like you know lastly about the characters because we didn't talk about the characters besides paul so besides paul who else are you know because he does you know the 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 way the story is broken up it's a it's in third person omniscient view and you definitely get snippets of you know other people's viewpoints as well besides paul from time to time so which other characters were your you know were intriguing to you let's not call talk about favorites but just which the characters stood out in your mind or well well written or just presented an interesting contrast to what paul was going through yeah that's interesting i mean there's so many there's a lot of great characters some of which don't get nearly uh, the one I think is the the most interesting and least utilized in a way is um, oh who's the warrior poet? Oh, oh yeah, oh, um, I can I can't remember his name. Now escapes me. I'll have to look he's, it up. He's probably the least utilized. Or the, I would have loved to explore that character a little bit more than is than is uh, in the books. But you know, I just the Baron is great. Um, and all of the sort of nefarious characters around the Baron, the, the evil mm-hmm. men tats and his, uh, you know, he just, he does such an excellent job of that. But then you've got these characters from the Fremen world that are just completely different. And, you know, he, he does an excellent job of exploring those cultural beliefs that are just the, totally different where they're, the way they think of you and, you know, trapping your water when you die and, um, you know, he, he does it's sort of like Shogun. The same reason I love Shogun is because it presents the Japanese in a way that is that is alien, exotic, and familiar again, right? Mm-hmm. So so Herbert does that with with these couple of different cultures in in Dune and and uh, you know the different even the Paul's mother, the Bene Jenner, Jessica, yep, Jessica, yep. Um, again, she is shown as living in two worlds, you know, she's, she's part of the Bene Gesserit world, but she's also living in the Atreides world, and she loves her husband, and she loves her son, but she's loyal to the Bene Gesserit, loyal-ish. Mm, uh, loyal-ish, that's true. Um, and you can just, it's such a human example of someone who's born in, in half, and, and is trying to square the circle, and and doesn't know how to keep everyone she loves safe, while also being loyal, and she, she sees this tragedy coming and she doesn't want it to happen, but what can she do? And again, I think another character that should have been explored maybe a little bit more is the emperor himself. Oh, the Padisha, yeah. Yes, yeah, Sodom, whatever it is. He does get explored a bit, but it would have been interesting to see more from his, his perspective. And um, so, because I think the justification for the destruction of the Atreides is maybe not quite explored as much as it should have been. Mm-hmm. I would have liked to see his challenges. They they kind of explored a little bit through his daughter. Yeah, Irulan, I believe. Uh, yeah, so you can see that that's how Her- Herbert is attempting to to give you more glimpses into the imperial world. Um, but I think that if it, if let's put it this way, if George Martin had written Dune, mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> you know, we would have been given the the full imperial scale. So I'm I'm getting away from characters and I'm complaining that that George <laughs> Martin should have been the uh, he should have been like a, in a partnership with Herbert and and he should have given us the the more imperial uh, story like the the setup before he created Arrakis you know that that is very true because he would have definitely focused on the whole houses the you know the the the, the warfare between them the reasons for the warfare between them the whole history the brutal jihad it and would be fascinating. Fair- in fairness to uh, Herbert's son, who wrote the prequels or whatever, maybe that's what they—they they probably get into all of that. He probably does everything. I'm, I'm asking. I haven't read them. I haven't read Brian Herbert. I believe his name is, and he yeah, he wrote a bunch of stuff, the prequels and the sequels with Gavin J. Anderson. But I haven't read them. Uh, I, I I follow this blogger, and he's really well known. Uh, Adam Whitehead, Word Zone is his blog. He was, you know 
brave enough to review them and I have read some of the reviews and they have not been kind. Like he eviscerates the books for basically just taking, you know, or creating whole new plots from like lines from the original books and saying that this is literally fan fiction. Yeah. There's well, nothing more to it. it. That's what it, it is. is, obviously. I mean, of course, he he's his son and, you know, the, I mean, if it, it is authorized by them. So what can you say? Like, is it truly fan fiction or not? But that's again a topic for maybe the true hardcore Herbert fans to discuss, yes. not for us. But yes. so I just want to end it over here because uh, thank you again, Richard, for your time and for this excellent discussion. Uh, you know, before we end, I would love to maybe have you, maybe I would love for you to maybe have some ending thoughts or if you want to talk about something else, I would love to hear that. Uh, and we will definitely would love to have you back for discussing other your other favorite books or other favorite fantasy series because I know this wasn't technically fantasy and we are officially on Fantasy Book Critic. So uh, uh, any parting thoughts, sir? Well, that's, you know, you could probably have a discussion just about whether it's science fiction or whether it's fantasy or what is it. Um, I, I know Herbert himself said he doesn't care. He's sort of yeah. like me. You know, I, I don't care about genre. Genre is really for readers. It's for uh, marketers. It's for people who sell books and for people who buy books. It's, it's hardly for writers to say. And uh, if somebody wants to put your book in whatever category, I think the wisest thing for a writer to say is go ahead. Um, but final thoughts, um, you know, the reason I picked Dune is because it is such a, a historical masterwork that I think if any reader of fantasy or science fiction should read, um, if you, especially if you want to write, if you are a, a burgeoning writer or you're hoping to do it, you should read this book because it's going to teach you something. Um, and I know when I was young and reading it, I... I was mind blown, not just by the content and by the creativity, but by the storytelling. Mm -hmm. It's rare that, and it shouldn't be, but it's rare that writers are as good as storytellers as Frank Herbert. And it might sound strange, but it is the case. Storytelling is not a requirement. Being an excellent storyteller is not the requirement of being a writer. Mm -hmm. It is, you have to have some skill, but everybody has some skill. And there's, there's vast differences between an amateur and a professional, I would say Herbert's just a natural storyteller. I don't think he's particularly practiced in the craft like a George Martin, let's say, but, but he's a natural storyteller and it shows. So it's, it's a very valuable book to read. It is sort of fantasy, science fiction, canon. You know, it's if, if you want to be literate in the genre, if you want to understand so many of the things that follow, um, you have to read it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think if you are a fan of the genre, you should be concerned about these books that now we could talk about lots of the other books that are canon, but those are for another day. Okay. That's perfectly fair. Uh, so thank you again for your time. And to everybody who's watching this, if you haven't read Dune, go ahead and read it. The movie's already out. There has been a previous movie which showed, showed the entire book, but you know, if you're waiting and if you didn't, if you enjoyed the movie, great, read the book. If you didn't enjoy the movie, you can still read the book and figure out why it has enthralled so many millions of people including Richard over here uh, as well. So thank you again for to everybody and to Richard for your time and consideration. And we look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Bye, everybody. Bye.